Allie Driver and I got married 45 years ago today. 45 years ago. <laughs> we met in algebra class in high school. Her name was Driver, mine is Dart. Our teacher seated everybody alphabetically, and by that uh, stroke of God's will, the two of us came together uh, when we were just in high school. We dated for three years before we got married, so we've actually been friends for 48 years, and looking forward to 50 and well beyond that. We are in love, of course, but we also, all these years, have been best friends. And that is a really, I, I, I can't think every married couple that I have ever known could say that. Uh, <clears throat> they in love with one another, they, they put up with one another, they do what they have to do. Of course, all of us do that. But we really have been best friends. We are the, each of us is the one person in the world that we know we can depend on no matter what happens. And we also know from over the years that we complement one another. In other words, we fill in for one another. Uh, in the areas where one of us may be lacking, the other one is there to be strong. And I thought about that and I thought, you know, that there are a few things that so demonstrate the genius of God as does a good marriage. Because he made man and he made woman to go together, to be with one another and to support one another. In Genesis, the second chapter in verse 18, we have this little vignette where the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone I will make a help meet for him. I remember as a boy reading this particular passage of scripture and thinking it was a little strange because the way it's, read, the way it's written, you almost can come to a wrong conclusion. Let me show you what I mean. He said, I, uh, it's not good that a man should be alone. I'll make a help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and he brought him to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that was the name of it. And Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. The image you get, as certainly I did as a young person reading this, is that here God created man, he looked at man, he says, well, I don't think it's good for him to be alone here. Let's see, what shall we make for him? And he starts making animals. And he brings this animal up and he says, what do you want to name it? And Adam names it. And he brings another one up, Adam names it. But they can't find any of these animals that are really sufficient to be a help fit for God, like a trial and error type of thing. Which, of course, I really don't think was what was happening here at all. And you take a little different look at it, it's easy to see that this was just a part of the process that was going on. But it was not that God ever expected to find a help for Adam among the animals. They were not sufficient to that. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and he brought her to the man. The, the symbolism of this is really striking, because when you think of what God might have done, if you have an inquiring mind, you're going to say, well, why didn't God just make them both at the same time? Why didn't he just make two mounds of dirt here and uh, let both of them, one of them be male and one of them be female and bring them up that way? Why the taking of a rib out of Adam and the making of a wife from that? Well, it does a couple of things. And I think one of the most important aspects of it is it shows how close the woman is to the man. She is really not a separate creature. She is not one that was made over here alongside of. She was one that was made out of. And Paul in the New Testament even seems to have the opinion that since every man in history would come from a woman, that it was necessary that the first woman come from man to kind of balance things out. But the, the implications of it certainly, I think, are that right out of the man's rib is where the woman comes from, that close. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, as you read that passage, and you read especially this last sentence in here, you sort of wonder about that as to the whys and the wherefores of it, why it was remarkable that they were naked, since there were only two of them anyway, why it is remarkable that they were not ashamed. Uh, if they were man and wife, if they were together, one would have thought there would be no reason for them to be ashamed. 
It's hard to say for sure, but I think you can conclude in reading the statement as it is put here, for a reader in days to come, that for the reader in days to come, it says this, that it was God's intent that his man and his woman be intimate with one another, and that there be no shame involved in that intimacy. There is something about the, the closeness of a man and a woman who are completely intimate with one another that creates a relationship that otherwise is simply not going to exist. No animal, no creature that God ever made can have a relationship with God in, in, like another person can because they don't have the mind. Animals do not really have that much in the way of free will. I mean, they can make a decision to eat now or eat later. Uh, they can make a decision to sleep now or bark. Uh, you know, they make that level decisions at that level. But animals don't function at the mental level of man. <coughs> and two individuals, <coughs> human beings, who can function at the same level, can have relationships at different levels, but the only way that a truly intimate relationship can be established, established is in that physical intimacy that breaks down every barrier between a man and a woman. And that seems to be apparently what God had in mind in this. He left them there in the garden naked, and there was no shame in the fact that they were naked. And one gets the impression that he expected certain very natural things to follow from that circumstance. But there's a lot more to this than intimacy in the genius of marriage, the genius of a good marriage, of God putting a good man and a good woman together and keeping them together for all their lives. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, there's a passage where Solomon writes about this because I think that Solomon came to understand he never really experienced a good marriage, but I think he came to understand the underlying principles of it because he had this gift of wisdom from God more than any man who had ever lived and consequently was able to tell us things. And some of the things that, Paul, that Solomon tells us, he tells us from having experienced the opposite. In other words, it's not as though he himself is a good example. He is a good example of what happens when you don't do things God's way. He said, I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone and there is not a second. Yea, he has neither child nor brother. There is no end of his labor. His eye isn't satisfied with riches. And he doesn't say, for whom am I working and bereaving my soul of good? What am I doing all this for? This is a sore travail. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Now, this is fascinating as he begins to develop this thing here because you're thinking back in a world when he wrote this where women kept at home and men were the ones that worked in the field. At least that's the impression you might have. But the truth is, if anybody who's ever been on a farm before knows, farmers' wives work just as hard as farmers do. And the work that is done by both of them is, is, is very important. And the truth is that with all the work of the washing, the mending, the taking care of the home and the house and the children, with the additional work that a farmer's wife does in growing food for the family in the, in, in the garden patch a part of the place, of a helping husband out in the field in the hard days of work, of being with him side by side in the lifting and the pulling and the straining and all of farm work, two can accomplish things that one simply cannot accomplish. In fact, two can accomplish more together than two can accomplish separately. It's called synergy. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. And I can honestly say that looking back over our marriage over the years that we've been together, we are absolutely far more than the sum of our parts and the things that the two of us have been able to accomplish together that we never could have done if the two of us had been working separately in our own ways and our own times. It's just a matter of people picking up for one another and helping one another. And Solomon saw that. He said, this is this clear. He said, if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falls, for he has not another to help him. Again, if two lie together, they can be warm. But how can one be warm alone? If one prevails against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. I think we understand that principle. And I, but I think the time that this all really came home to me regarding marriage was when Allie had major surgery and back in, I think it was 1977. She had a growth on her thyroid, and as a consequence, and of course she'd never ever had, I don't think, any kind of surgery, major or minor or anything else before that period of time. 
And the, the prospect of having to go to the hospital and having half her thyroid removed was, not, was rather daunting, to say the very least. And it was my job to be supportive through that whole thing. But I, we understood this. I, I'd had my major surgery back in 1955 for a diaphragmatic hernia repair, which is pretty dramatic. You know, they open up your chest and spread your ribs and collapse a lung and do all kinds of nasty things to you. And the recovery is long and painful. And she was there for me, that whole thing. You know, she, was a, she, kept, she would visit me in the hospital, bring things to me. She worried about me, cried, <laughs> cried when she saw me lying there with tubes coming out of every particular direction in my body. But she was there for me. But it did not register on me as much what it meant until I was there for her. To see her helpless and hurting touched me as few things ever have. I wanted more than anything else to ease her pain and to make her comfortable and to do something. And I came to realize how important it is not to be alone when you go in the hospital. Because she was not even, even after she had recovered from the anesthesia, she was not together enough to call the nurse. She didn't even have the strength to reach over and grab the thing and didn't even, was still fuzzy, so fuzzy, she wasn't even sure about what it was she was supposed to grab or press or pull in order to bring the nurse to the room. And I had to call the nurse on more than one occasion during the day and on into the evening because it took her a very long time, we think due to an allergic reaction, to come completely out of the anesthesia. And I was there for her. And I thought how, how desperate it is for a person to have to go into the hospital and have no one there for them. You know, I, I have the greatest respect for the nursing cadres of these hospitals and for the doctors. They work hard. They do their work. They have systems. And frankly, they are far better now than they used to be. The progress has been made not only in, in medical science, but in patient care and caring for patients and caring about patients have improved enormously over the years, certainly over what it was when I was in the Naval Hospital, I can tell you for sure. Of course, there at least you had a guy in a bed next to you who could call somebody if you were too weak. Uh, but it was, it, it was something to, be, to realize uh, that a person who is in the hospital, even with the best of intentions and care and everything else on the part of the nursing station, really needs somebody in the room the whole time during those first desperate hours after you come out of anesthesia when a lot still hangs in the balance on certain kinds of major surgery. I stayed with her that afternoon and on into that evening, and I think it was well in the morning hours before she really got herself together enough to say, what are you still doing here for? You need to go home and get some sleep. And when she was that far along, I was able to go do it. But what it was about that that struck me was, was the underlining. It, it, I mean, I knew the principle. I read the Bible. I could have cited the scripture for you. But that was where it was written in my heart that it is better, two are better than one. Because if one falls, the other can help them up. And down through the years, apart from our major hospitalizations, there have been other times when one or the other of us gets sick or is in the hospital for a minor thing or whatever it is it may be. And the, th the fact that you know that the other person is there, you know that that other person is dependable, you know you can count on that other person come hell or high water to be there for you means more than anything I can tell you. I know that many of you know that already and have experienced it yourself. I say some of this, although for the benefit of you younger people, because that's one of the things that marriage is about. Marriage is about love and flowers and weddings and, and all this good stuff and all the romance that's involved in it. But, but marriage is also about being there for the other person when the other person is sick, of uh, being there when the other person is discouraged and downhearted and, and weepy and, and things have gone wrong, or being there for them when they have lost a member of their family whom they love dearly. You know, because all of us go through these patterns. Our mother dies, our father dies. And having someone to be there for you, someone to lean on, someone to encourage you is more important than, than I think any of you young people yet will realize. Although many of you who have already been through it know exactly what I'm talking about and understand why I would say that I have. I would say what I have. The, the fact that we have been there for each other over all these years is an enormous blessing. And I think also that in 45 years, we have made, in 48 actually, uh, considering the dating time, we have made an enormous investment in one another. Here is a person who knows me better than any human being alive on the face of this planet. I have no family member who knows me like the one I go to bed with every night and I wake up with every morning. No one in this world knows me like my wife. I feel so sorry for Solomon because even though he is able to describe what I have, he never had it. He never experienced it. 
and never knew what it was like. He did not have one woman with whom he was intimate and whom he loved above all others. Because, you see, you can't be intimate with, not you can't really be intimate with two or three or four or five women. You can kind of do an intimate act or you can kind of have a kind of intimacy. But sex, you know, or having sex with, with a dozen people is one thing. Being intimate with a person is another thing altogether where you actually come to know the deepest secrets and the deepest heartfelt needs and desires and the, the inner workings of the person and where you come to know and to read one another like ESP almost to where sometimes words do not even need to be spoken for you to understand what the person is going to say and how often you can predict what's about to be said before it's ever said. How often you can almost hand the salt before the salt is asked for to use an illustration, a very mundane illustration. Solomon never had that. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, 1,000 women. How in the world can you ever be intimate with one when there are hundreds of others that you have had the same relationship with? The uniqueness of the sexual relationship, the uniqueness of intimacy, the uniqueness of being naked and alone and not ashamed it has to be unique or it does not exist. Solomon didn't really like women. Womanizers don't, you know. A lot of people would probably have that. I saw a movie once called The Man Who Loved Women. And uh, it was interesting theory all by itself. But I, what struck me when I saw the title, the idea is a man who chases women, you know. But my experience has led me to conclude and I have read elsewhere, and I know that this is true, that people who chase skirts, men who chase women, men who are womanizers, don't like women. Now, women are so, they, they, they have fun when they're with women, they enjoy being with women, but they don't really like them. You should hear what womanizers say about women when they're away from women and only with men. They speak about them in the most despicable terms. They use terrible terminology, terrible description. And you have no secrets with a man like that. He'll tell anybody because a part of the, the, the whole deal of womanizing is keeping score. And if you keep score and you don't tell anybody what your score is, nobody knows. But womanizers don't like women. And Solomon was a womanizer. Well, just because he married all of them, that doesn't mean he wasn't, does it? I mean, he was a man who made women his hobby. He collected them. Some people, you know, collect figurines. Some people collect model airplanes. Solomon collected women. Had a collection of 1,000 of them. He could have them lined up for him in a half hour's notice, all of them. He'd go by and do an inspection of the harem. Collected women. He said, I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason for things. I decided I'd want to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. And I find more bitter than death, the woman. Now, a lot depends on this verse on how the punctuation goes. But I kind of think what he is saying is, I find more bitter than death, the woman. The woman whose heart is snares and nets. Her hands are like bands. Whoever pleases God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Now, maybe he's talking about a woman of a certain kind, and you can take it that way. But on the other hand, you could take it as though he's talking about women being this kind. Because in fact, it, may, it, was, it, well, it wasn't the only kind of woman he knew about, but one almost gets the impre impression that it was the only kind of experience with a woman, or the only kind of woman he ever had experience with. Behold, this I have found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account which my soul seeks. But I find not. One man among a thousand I have found, but a woman among all these I have not found. This only have I found, that God made men upright and they have sought out many inventions. One man among a thousand he said he could find, and I presume he means it reliable, good, dependable, and all this kind of stuff, and he couldn't find one among the women. But you know, a good deal of what a woman is, is her man. A great deal of what makes a woman good and just 
and dependable and fine and great is the man who selects her as his wife and whom she selects as her husband and who settles in to spend his life with this woman because we change one another. Now, there is always the folly we talk about on people, about people about, you know, how women will oftentimes marry a guy because they think he'll get better. And of course, that's a very bad idea to do that. Very bad idea to do that. Your parents will warn you about it. I'll warn you about it right here and now. Don't ever, don't ever imagine that he's going to get better. I said he would change. I didn't say he would get better. And he certainly will not get better because uh, the fact that you're going to take out your tools and make him into something better than he is today. That's not going to happen. You can write that off. But the point still is that all of us, the man and the woman in a marriage, become something different from what we are. We grow and we develop and we become better or we become worse based upon the interactions that take place between us once we have begun to share our lives together. And Solomon never spent enough time with any one woman for anything to develop in her, in him, or what have you. And he's the kind of man that had he been able to spend the time, to take the time, to hold himself back and to find the right one woman, marry her and stay with her for his life, would have created in the two of them an incredible combination because of the kind of man that Solomon was. But with all of his wisdom, he still couldn't control his libido because he had to have yet another woman. In all of that, though, Solomon did understand the value of a woman. He really did. Because he said in Proverbs 18, 22, whoever finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. And later in Proverbs, or sorry, in Pro earlier in Proverbs 5 in verse 14, he said, I was in almost all evil in the congregation of the assembly and I'd made a serious mistake. And then he says, drink waters out of your own cistern and running waters out of your own well. Now let me pause for a moment. Solomon has had a lot to say about the wicked woman, the street walker, uh, the prostitute looking out the window of her house or the married adulteress who's trying to snare some young fool wandering down the street. And he has a lot to say. In fact, he goes on and on and on through about the first nine chapters of, of, of Proverbs. He can't get away from the idea of the non-virtuous woman, to put it this way. This is what I'm saying about Solomon is not, was a man who did not like women, did not trust women, was uncomfortable about women because of a lot of very bad experiences that he had with women which were, as much as anything else, his own fault, strange as that may seem. But he didn't like them. But he did understand this point. And he says to his son, drink waters out of your own cistern, running waters out of your own well. Let, don't let your fountains be dispersed abroad in rivers of waters in the street. Let them be only your own and not a stranger's with you. Words, don't share yourself or your wife with other people, he says. So he did have the wisdom, in spite of all of his stupidity and all of his mistakes, not to make that one, or at least to tell his son not to make that one. He said, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant robe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times and be you ravished always with, your love, with her love. And why will you, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord. He ponders all his goings. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself. He shall be held with the cords of his sin. He shall die without instruction. In the greatness of his folly shall he go astray. Now, I think men make a lot of mistakes in our lives, don't we, fellas? That we really would prefer our children not make. That's what you're seeing with Solomon. Solomon, who has come to understand, you know, who has come to understand the, the, the tremendous danger of becoming involved with the wrong woman, the tremendous danger of being involved with a lot of women, and the disastrous effects it will have on a young man's life. And what he is telling you is, don't let your fountains be dispersed abroad in the streets. Don't go with every woman there is. Hang on. Take time. Find one. Invest yourself. And when you're going to make one single investment with the rest of your life with one person, it's critical that you take the time to know who that one person is. We got married rather young. 
And there were those who thought that we might have our problems as a result of having gotten married young because the truth is Allie and I had a very stormy courtship. It was on again, off again. It was, we had we'd make up and break up. Making up was all, a lot of fun. It was almost worth bre breaking up just to have the fun of making up again, but we used to joke about that. And people thought, well, they're, they're not going to, you know, they, 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 somebody I think said it gave our marriage maybe nine months or something like that. Well, it's been 45 years, and they're, they, they sort of missed their mark by quite a little bit. But someone else pointed out the, the difference, and reason, the reason why who, the person who gave us nine months was wrong. It had nothing to do with the storminess of the, of, the, of the period of time that we dated with one another. It was the fact that it was three years that we dated with one another. And by the time we got married, both of us knew precisely what we were doing. I'm often amused, and Allie is the same way, about these people who are portrayed in movies oftentimes as being scared and nervous and jittery on their wedding day and, and uh, aren't really sure they need to go through with this and somebody has to talk them into finishing up and going on with the wedding and all that type of thing. And, and she told me, she said, you know, I was never as certain in my, I never have been as certain in my life of anything as I was when I walked down that aisle to get married to you. And I felt exactly the same way. Neither one of us had a moment of nervousness. Neither one of us had a moment of a twinge because we both knew that we wanted to spend the rest of our lives together. And we knew what we were getting because we've been fighting for three years. And if you get it all out of your system before you get married and you know what you're doing and you still want to get married, you got a real good chance. But you know what the big deal is? It's time. It's the length of time you take to get to know one another. You can be lucky. You can marry, so you can marry somebody on the spur of the moment. You can marry somebody you haven't known very long and the marriage lasts for 50 years. But the odds are against you. And it is just luck. But when you take the time, the odds shift dramatically. Because I think there is something down inside of all of us. I think there's a subconscious thing that gives us little warnings from time to time about things when they're right and when they're wrong. And as long as you're still getting those warnings, you don't need to become intimate with that person. Maybe in time, it will stop. Maybe in time you will understand. Maybe in time you will grow. Maybe in time he will grow. And maybe in time you can make a beautiful, marvelous, lifelong marriage together. But as long as the worries and the frets and the insecurities and the little warning bells which God put inside of us for a reason are still going off, keep the guy or the girl at arm's length. Very important thing, I think, for us to understand. He said in Proverbs 12, verse 4, A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that makes ashamed is as rottenness in the bones. And all that stuff takes place when we make that initial decision. Make that initial decision. If we get married to someone who is not right for us, we're going to wind up with that other person being like rottenness in the bones. If that person is right for us, we're going to have our rocky roads, we're going to have our ups and our downs, but all the downs will be times of strong growth as we grow together, understand together, and become stronger and better people. And Solomon later, in chapter, I'm sorry, in, in chapter uh, 31 of Proverbs, in verse 10 says this about the virtuous woman. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? <clears throat> now, he'd run through a thousand women and had not found one. So you can understand his, his reference, who can find one? You know, her price has got to be far above rubies because there must not be very many of them out there. But what is probably true about Solomon and, and, and that he did not understand is that among that 1,000 women that were in his harem, there were probably all kinds of women who could have been virtuous women, but never got the chance, never had the support, never had each one of them her own man to be a strength, to be a pillar, to be an advisor, a counselor, a lover, a, a, a helper, an encourager, because we don't do it by ourselves. And I don't believe a woman becomes the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31 by herself. Don't think that happens. Because, you know, it, it speak, when it speaks of her, it speaks of her with a husband. Her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. Trust. 
I will tell you this right now, and I'll come, come back to it again. There is absolutely no ingredient in marriage more important than trust. It needs to be cherished, taken care of, nourished, protected, fought for. Trust is critical. And the ability to actually say, no, I know precisely what my man is going to do. I know what he will say. I know whether he did this or whether he did not because I know his character. And oftentimes a woman doesn't even need to ask her husband, is an accusation against him true because she knows it is not. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works willingly with her hands. She's like the merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. She's the kind of gal that you know, doesn't just buy the closest thing at whatever price it's at. She's a shopper. She makes it around to the markets. And if this market's crooked, she goes to another market over there, which is not so crooked. She knows her, her way. She rises while it is yet night, gets up in the dark, and gives food to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. You know, she didn't, she didn't get a field and, and mention it to her husband. She considered a field and bought it. With the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. You know what this woman is doing? She's running a little business on the side. She makes clothes, she plants a vineyard, she makes wine, and she probably sells it. She girds her loins with strength, strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good. You know what merchandise is? That's stuff we put on the market. So she's making clothes, she's growing food, she's making wine, and she sells it. Her candle doesn't go out by night. What that basically means is that when she makes a candle, it's a good one, doesn't go out on you. I don't think it necessarily means that she works all night. She lays her hands to the spindle, her hands hold the distaff. She stretches out her hand to the poor. She reaches forth her hands to the needy, the generous and a kind person. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Now, the implication of this is that this woman is tremendously successful. Purple was the most expensive dye of the time. And very, very few people would have had the money to have a garment of silk, especially silk dyed purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes fine linen and sells it and delivers girdles to the merchant. Strength and honor her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. He, you know, it presents us here in the economic structure of the household of a two-person team. The woman at home, the man in the field, and yet at the same time, both of them working toward the economic success of the family. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and her tongue is the law of kindness. She looks well to the ways of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but you excel them all. Favor is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates." In the gates is kind of in that uh, culture a synonym for saying publicly. Her husband will be honored in the gates. That means publicly. That she, her name will be known publicly because of the kind of woman she is, because of the hard work she does, and because of the quality of the work, the goods, and so forth that she produces. Now all these words come from Solomon, a man whose wives and concubines probably did very little work of any kind. I mean, after all, you're the wife of a king. You don't have to work. You've got servants, servants of your own. They get to do the work. You don't have to do it. Then there is Paul in Ephesians 5, 22. It's a sermon I and mean, it's a scripture we often read in marriages. There's something, though, that I want you to, to understand about this passage before I read it to you. This is something that each, each, the husband and the wife, should strive for in a marriage. But I think we also understand that this is a two-way deal. You cannot demand the one thing from the other unless you are prepared to do the, your side of things yourself. In other words, it's not a one-way deal. You can't make demands of the other when you're not fulfilling your side of this thing. Well, Paul said, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. 
Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands in everything. And what Paul talks about here is, is a simple understanding that in any kind of a team, a team situation, one person leads and the other follows. In other words, but, but, but this does not mean you know, that, that the, uh, the, there's a secondary person or a secondary level of person or an inferior person in the relationship. It's just that in any two-person team, one leads. That's all there is to it. And for some reason, God has made the structure in the family and the home that the man ought to lead. But what if he doesn't? And what if he won't? Well, some men have been luck who, who are not leaders and won't lead have been lucky enough to find wives who can lead and have led the family and have led the family successfully. <clears throat> that is not what God suggests to us that we do. It's not his way. But he, as I say, it's better than having no leadership in the family at all. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, let the wives be to their husbands and everything. Then it says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. <clears throat> now, I would say that of the burden placed upon husbands and wives in Ephesians 5, by far and away the greater burden is laid upon the man. Because the woman's responsibility is to love her husband, to cherish her husband, to be obedient to her husband, to let her husband, you know, not let her husband lead, but to follow his lead. But the man is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. There was nothing that Christ would not do <coughs> for the church. <coughs> that he might sanctify it, <coughs> present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. And I am certain that that is true. That a man who loves his wife loves himself. And since I love myself, and I'm supposed to love my wife like I love myself, then I have quite a, quite a task laid out for me, don't I? So that's something we men are supposed to do. And by and large, I find that the more a man is apt to talk about wives submitting to their husband, the less apt he is to be fulfilling this thing of husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That I don't know why it is, but it tends to work that way. And in families where both are pulling their weight in regard to this, there's hardly ever a mention of it. Hardly ever a mention of it because it is natural to work this way. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now I want to give you today, <laughs> excuse me, some random advice from 45 years of marriage to the single, those of you who have not been married. Number one, abstain from sex before marriage. I know it's obvious. I know people talk about it all the time. But I think it is very rare for anybody to be able to somehow really explain or make clear why it is so. And I don't know that I can. But I can tell you that everything changes after sex. Once that first intimate act is, is, is carried out, everything is different. Sex with no commitment, without the permanent commitment, will wreck your life. Now, I, I have been watching, uh, you know, I watch television some from time to time, and I've been noticing a recurring commercial, which I find very disturbing. It's a commercial for a drug that is designed to suppress genital herpes. And I forget the figures about the numbers of young people now who are afflicted with genital herpes, but it, it just... It just shocked me to the core of my being to, to read this and then to see and to hear the commercial as it goes on to tell you that, that you never are free from it. It is incurable. It never goes away. And it, it, it offers this drug that you can take that suppresses the, the symptoms of it. And then it tells you, and all, all through this, you show this beautiful young woman and good looking young man walking together along the beach. And, it said it, and then the warnings come along. That even though you are not at the moment, uh, even though you have it suppressed at the moment, you can still pass it on. And I looked at it and I thought, 
here's a person who can have lived all their life clean, have gone all the way through high school and never had sex, all the way through college, never had sex, and marry this good looking guy that she loves and cares the world for, and then the first thing she knows, she's turning up with genital herpes, which is very painful, a very discouraging disease. And it's just with you then for the rest of your life. And the list of things now that people are passing around, back when I was in the Navy, they warned us a lot about what we called in those days venereal diseases. And, and there were the two big ones were gonorrhea and syphilis. And we, you know, they, but they found cures to both of those, pretty good cures. I mean, you, antibiotics and so forth, you can straighten those out. Now, the range of things that people talk about freely on television and in family hour time, and the list is as long as your arm. And more and more of them are becoming incurable. Nothing will touch them. And some of them now we're finding are fatal. And some of them, uh, which they now believe even that, that uh, those, those uh, particular diseases can actually be a cause <coughs> of some forms of cancer in women. And I think how tragic this is. It happens because people have sex before the two of them have made a permanent, total commitment to one another. Do not shack up. And there are a lot of things that can happen as a result of premarital sex, and nearly all of them are bad. Number two, take your time about getting married. We dated for three years. And it's not so much how old you are when you get married, it's how well you know one another. Because there is something down inside of us that will see and will sense and will respond intuitively to something that is wrong in the other person if we will take the time to recognize the difference between a, a minor foible over here that a guy may grow out of and a serious character flaw. Have a, number three, have a real wedding with family and friends around. You know, before that relationship ever takes place. I say, I, first I said a formal wedding, but people will think I mean uh, tuxedos and, and all that kind of stuff. That's not what I mean. I mean a real wedding with a minister, in a church if possible, with family and friends around and make those promises that you make public. Number four, commit before God to stick it out and not get a divorce. Now that means that you have got to be especially careful going in, doesn't it? And if, you'll ever, if you've ever listened to my wedding ceremony, that, that thing is really permanent. You know, that you take this vow till death do you part. Number five, girls, stay away from angry, violent men. A lot of times an angry man is exciting. A lot of times an outlaw is exciting. But eventually they're likely to kill you. Stay away from angry violent men. Break off with them after the first angry outburst without ever looking back. A man like that can not only get you killed somewhere down the line, he could get your children killed as well. And these, the, uh, the studies that have now been done about men who are that way and have those inclinations are, they don't change. And I don't know what the hypnotic effect is that they have on some women, but there are some women who seem to be unable, once they have gotten involved with a man like that, they seem to be unable to make the break. I would say to any of you young ladies who are listening to my voice out there, that if you ever find yourself in that circumstance, get help. Go to your brother, go to your dad, go to somebody, go to your minister, go to some woman whom you trust. Get help because you need to break away from a man like that. If a man ever hits you, if he even threatens to hit you, get away from him and don't look back. Number six, I know you love this person, but do you like her? And do you like him? If you don't, don't get married. You know, I love my dog. Uh, I know all kinds of people. I know men that I love. I know I've had men in my lifetime that I have loved and I didn't really like very well because of their character and their attitude, but I loved them because of time we had spent together and things that we had done together, and I would be willing. You know, I'd go down and bail them out of jail if I had to. That would be, that's an act of love. But I don't like what they do. I don't like the way they live their life. And women need to make the distinction between the fact that you can love a stray dog but you shouldn't marry one. And there's some stray men that you can love and care a lot about, but you can't afford to marry one. They will ruin your life.
And number seven, if you're not sure about getting married, don't. Just don't. Neither of us had the least doubt when we got married. If you have doubts, it is never too late to break it off before the marriage. I don't care if you're just taking your dad's arm to walk down the aisle. Better to give back all the wedding presents. Better to throw the party afterwards just as a party instead of a wedding reception. Better to cry and shed some tears and fall, you know, and weep on the shoulders of your bridesmaids than to spend the rest of your life with a man who's going to hurt you. To married couples, number one, cultivate the art of negotiation. I haven't had to use this an awful lot in my lifetime, but there's just this beautiful little expression that I think that we're most, most people are afraid of, and they're afraid of it from both sides. The expression is this, the statement is this, the question, what would it take to make you happy? Now we don't want to ask it because if the person tells us we feel an obligation to do it, and if we're asked the question, we're almost afraid to tell the person because then we got to be happy. And that may be the harder side of the thing. But my point is simply this, that a lot of times when we get involved in arguments and, and, and disagreements in a marriage, each of us is going back and forth trying to make ourselves happy and instead of stopping for a moment saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, what does he really want from me at this point? What does she really want me to do? And the best way to find out, dear, what would it take to make you happy on this? I really want you to be happy. What do you want me to do? Men don't, not likely to say that to their wives because she's liable to say, put your clothes up. Every evening when you come home, put your clothes up. Uh, then who knows what she may ask you to do. If you, you know, maybe some terrible thing like that. And so we tend to be afraid of it. But the truth is, it's just simple negotiation. If your wife asks you to do something that you really can't do, or don't have confidence you can do, or don't want to do, you just say, when you say, well, what do you, what would it take to make you happy? And she says, I expect you to do this. You say, well, I'm sorry, I can't do that. You know, what, how, can we work, how can we work our way around this? I do think it's important, frankly, for married couples to understand that it's okay to negotiate. It's okay to say, okay, I'll do that, but you've got to do this. Or, you know, let's, uh, you know, what do you want? Okay, that's what you want. Well, okay, I'll do that if you'll do this. Just simple art of negotiation. Number two, don't make very many promises. And don't make any that you can't keep. And once you've made them, keep them. And number three, and this may be the most important thing I can tell any of you, married, single, you name it, tell the truth. Never lie to one another. Truth is the basis of trust. And without trust, you don't have anything. And I'm haunted by the image of our president standing before us and wagging his finger in our face and saying, you know, I never had sexual relationships with that woman. He'd better be telling the truth. He'd better be telling the truth. Because once that trust is broken, the chances are, you, if you ever get it back, it will be a very long time and there's a very good chance you'll never get it back at all. Because I think that, you know, in the military, there is a code of honor. And for an officer to lie to another officer, to lie to his commanding officer to protect his own backside, is a bigger breach than just about anything you can do in the military. You've got to be able to trust one another when you're going into battle. You've got to be able to believe the men that you work with. You've got to be able to trust their honor and their integrity. Because if you don't, you can get, they can get you killed. And so it is with a husband and wife. You have got to be able to always know when your wife or your husband look you in the eye and say, I didn't do that, that you can take it to the bank. You can rely on that. And you must never, ever let that get away from you. It's more precious than rubies or anything else. It may be painful to tell the truth, but I want to tell you something. The pain of telling the truth today is nothing compared to the total pain your life will have if you don't. Tell the truth, get it over with, and get on with living. Don't lie, because the, 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 you know, the willingness and the, the ability to know that I know you're telling me the truth because you say so, <clears throat> is tremendously valuable. Number four, there may be a time to say nothing, but only <clears throat> if saying nothing does not constitute a lie. 
There are times when you say nothing that you are in effect lying to the other person because you should speak in that circumstance and they have a right to expect you to speak. And if you don't, you've lied. Number five, learn the value of being together in silence. Because there is something that passes between men and women in silence that I think is very precious and very important, but you'll never know about it. Some people feel that they're not together unless they're talking. And yet some people who have been together for a very long time learn to read one another without words. But they don't learn it if they're never quiet. Number six, do not expect your partner to read your mind. If you want something, say so. Now, I want to explain to you this, this just from a little personal experience. There is a great danger in a marriage that you will wind up doing things that neither of you really wanted to do because each of you is trying to please the other one. Any of you married couples ever do that? Really wound up doing something neither of you really cared or flipped about doing, but you did it because you thought the other person wanted to do it. And you don't say, well, dear, do you really want to do this? Because your partner will say, oh, well, then you don't want to do it. And we'll say, oh, well, because you don't want to do it, then we won't do it. And there's this funny little game that we play with one another. Uh, and all of us do it as married couples. Uh, well, I, you know, why, why would you like to go to a movie tonight? If you want to. Well, if I don't want to go to the movie, then we don't want it. Is that what you're saying? And you play these little, little, little round and round games about, well, what, does, what do you want and what do you don't want? And do you like this or do you don't like this? How easy it would be if we would just say, you know, I really don't care to, but I'll go if you'd like to. We are on good, honest, level ground, aren't we? Now we know. that I know that you're willing, because you love me, to go with the movie with me and see this, 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 this wretched thing. But that you really would rather not go. And so, we're honest. You now, we figured out many years ago that Allie does not care a flip for science fiction movies. And I like science fiction movies. And so I have to kind of, you know, figure out times and circumstances and ways so that I can go see a science fiction movie while she's got something else to do. But we understand each other in that because somewhere back down the line she told me she doesn't like them. She didn't keep pretending that she did. She just said, well, I don't care for them. And I think I could have figured that out before she told me if I'd been paying attention. But nevertheless, we, we all learn our lessons. My point is just simply this, that, that you know, being honest with one another means, to, means, means saying, I don't, I don't really enjoy that very much, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go and enjoy it with you, and I'll enjoy it because you're there. Let's do it. Now, there, let's say, we, we keep playing the games. And, and another thing, you may miss doing something you both will like, because neither one of you will say, let's do it. And we keep playing the, if you want to. Well, if it's all right with me, if it's all right with you, or in these little love, well, I guess we're love games, because we want to please the other person. Or because we want the other person to figure out what we want without them tell telling them. Is that maybe part of the game too? Uh, it's all a part of the little things that we do. Well, in 45 years, Allie and I figured out most of that stuff, and we, you know, we still play the little word games from time to time, but at least both of us know what's going on. And uh, we understand what we're doing. But don't expect your partner to read your mind. If you want something, say so. Seven, never allow your partner to forget an anniversary. I hear some chuckling going on out here because the way I worded that, I worded that very carefully, didn't I? I didn't say never forget an anniversary. I said never allow your partner to forget an anniversary. Because if you ever, if, you, if, if your husband or your wife forgets an anniversary, it's your own fault. Allie and I start talking about our anniversary weeks in advance. In fact, we, we were talking about the 45th anniversary some time ago. And we've already chatted from time to time about the 50th anniversary as to what we might want to do when our 50th anniversary comes around. I've already figured out a couple of things that, are, that Allie has said nope, you know, firmly to. So I got that straightened out. You know, I don't have to go through that again somewhere down the, down the line. Except that I'm liable to forget it and have to be told again. But, uh, you know, the, 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 the importance, again, of, you know, there, there's a little game that, that, that married couples play, and I think women are more prone to do it with their husbands than the other way around, but I could be wrong about this, is that they won't bring up the anniversary. They want to see if he will remember it. Because if he remembers it, it means he loves them, and if he doesn't remember it, it means he doesn't love them. Which is stupid, uh, beyond belief. But it's a game that married couples play. And uh, I think that if a woman lets her husband forget the anniversary, 
then she saved him some money on an anniversary present. Why worry about it? My point is, why don't you talk about it and don't play games? Uh, we always talk about these things. We make little comments along the way uh, to be sure that that kind of, we never, an anniversary never cre creeps up on us that we have not planned for and made arrangements for and know what we're going to do. And we, we know precisely what we're going to do, and where we're going to go and uh, so forth this evening uh, for our 45th wedding anniversary. I recommend that to all of you. And the reason why I think that this is important, apart from the, the funny little thing about forgetting anniversaries, is that I think it's really important that an anniversary renews without bothering, I, I, I don't think we will ever see any reason to renew our vows. I mean, we made good solid vows to start with, and they are there and they dominate our lives to this day. But I do think we renew our appreciation for our marriage and for each other and for what we have accomplished together by the celebration every year of the day in which the two of us committed our lives to one another. And to those of you who are single listening to me, <clears throat> I hope the day will come when you're celebrating your 45th and 50th wedding anniversary, where you have committed your life to one person and have been with that one person through all those years, through all the pain and through all the, 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 the glory and the success and the failure and the learning, and have become strong and healthy people through the marriage relationship and become the kind of people that you never could have become by yourself. God bless all your marriages.